how do countries become wealthy? There's generally three or four pathways which you have. And that third option really is the only option that is viable for virtually all African countries. Remy, thank you. Welcome. Well, since I've discovered you, it's just been so nice. And you might think I'm stalking you on uh, Twitter because I'm always like reposting for those in the back. But I feel like people should hear everything you have to say. And of course, you know, but when I found out that you were going to have a book out, I could not wait. I pre-ordered it and then I received it and I read it in one sitting. It was just really, really great. Because, you know, Remy, your book was for me, it was so intuitive, but it was so great that you took the time to put all the numbers and this research to back it up. But before we go into any of this, I would like for Remy to tell us who you are, because I know you, but our audience needs to know more. Thank you. So I was born to a Nigerian father and a Polish mother in Nigeria. Uh, I grew up in Nigeria. I went to primary and secondary school in Nigeria. <clears throat> and so my formative years were spent in Nigeria. And I think my worldview up till today was to a significant extent um, shaped by my experiences in Nigeria and the things I saw around me, you know. And then after secondary school in Nigeria, I moved to Poland, my mother's uh, home country. And I lived in Poland there. I went to university. I worked in Poland for many years. And Poland was where I first came into contact really with this whole race issue and had to start thinking deeply about it because I pretty much had no choice because I lived in Poland, got there in the late 90s. Uh, and there was sort of crude racism there, you know, people calling you names on the street and, and, and things like that. That level of that level of racism that this was before Poland had even joined the EU. And so me and the, my friends, you know, from the African um, uh, community, there's tiny African community, most of us students, we talked about, you know, these things a lot. And always sort of, you know, asking ourselves, you know, where does this come from? You know, why do these people feel that, you know, they can talk to us like this? Why do they feel that they're better than us and, and, and things like that? And so I started um, thinking about the whole race issue there. And then um, in 2015, I moved to the UK. Uh, so the UK is a very different country from, um, uh, you know, both uh, Poland and Nigeria. And the UK is the first multiracial country I've lived in. So Nigeria is obviously practically everybody's black, Poland, practically everybody's white. And uh, the UK is the first multiracial country I've lived in. And um, definitely, I'd say the most um, tolerant country I'd lived in, in with regards to people being used to seeing people of various skin colors and various skin shades here. So here, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, people have been seeing all kinds of people from all parts of the world here for donkey years. So unlike Poland, there's that um, uh, there's that difference, and of course here the whole race debate is big. Uh, people talk about it a lot, and so I started listening to what people were saying about it here, and uh, and you know some of the things I agreed with, some of the things I disagreed with strongly, and and then I I, I started also trying to contribute my own uh, little bit to the discussion around here, and that's how I started, you know, writing about race issues here also. And um, right now, uh, Remy, you're also a professor at, at the same time right now, right? You're... I'm a lecturer, a politics lecturer at the University of York. And so, yes, so I lecture also, um, one of the key um, uh, modules I lecture is on a module titled Africa and International Politics. Uh, where I talk about the, you know, the relationship between various um, uh, African states and Africa as a continent and the rest of the world, essentially, you know, what, what's the, what's the position in the international system? Why does it resemble the way it resembles? And what uh, potentially are the ways forward that are being proposed out there? And so, and that's something I'm really happy to be able to, to be able to teach here because I can interact with young students. And so I have, you know, um, I see, you know, 19, 20 year old um, British students and students from other Western countries and from various parts of the world, Chinese students. I have also, you know, in my groups and I see, you know, the way they think about, about Africa and African countries. Um, you know, what their mindset is, what they think the problems are, where they think the problems came from and what they think the potential solutions are. And it's always interesting for me to observe uh, to observe that. Let's go into that. Let's dive into that, because I think this is very important. And let's talk about um, mm. our fellow Africans. And if you feel like we should separate the way um, our fellow Africans who are still in the motherland think versus the way uh, Africans who are in the diaspora think, if you think we need to make that distinction, by all means, let's do it. But for now, mm -hmm. I tend to feel mm -hmm. that um, this is something that I got really sad about because I felt like 
whether we have left the continent, um, you know, whether we're in the diaspora or we are still more, more or less, um, you know, living back home and have more or less all the time being back home, I have found that we we tend to still be thinking the same way, meaning that I would have expected better from those of us who have gotten an opportunity to go elsewhere and see elsewhere how the, how things are working. But going back to that, and when you're saying it was very interesting for me to observe the way they think. Please take me into what you have observed. You know, what are you seeing our fellow Africans, you know, thinking is the reason why the status of blackness is where it is? What what, what have you found? And again, make any, compartmentalize anything you, you think needs to be put into different buckets. So I think there's a clear difference between what those who were brought up here in the West or came to the West at a very young age think about the reasons for where Africa is today, speak, generally speaking, and those who were brought up in Africa and have just come here or came here at an adult age. There's a very big difference in how they think and also in what they are ready to say on the race issue. Now, generally speaking, those who were brought up here uh, think along similar lines to their white British colleagues around what the problems of Africa are. So generally speaking, the, obviously, you know, w- where have they learned about, ab- about Africa? Either perhaps a little that was said at home. And generally, mm. their mindset is that Africa is where it is today, which is not in a generally good place because of colonialism, because of slavery, and that most, if not all, of the problems facing African states today are directly traceable to what they would call structures inherited from the colonial period. That's for people who were brought here at a young age. That's the people who were brought up here in the West, whether they are white or, or black or brown. That would generally be their view. And um, plus that, they will add that the other structures they will mention, present day structures, will be the general, what they would call, you know, neoliberal institutions, World Bank, IMF, those kinds of institutions. They would say those also are the institutions that are in the present day, almost continuing sort of the imperial imperialist legacies of keeping African states down and keeping African states poor. So they, they generally intuit, they generally sort of have that feeling that they are conscious, more or less conscious efforts uh, going on to keep African states poor. Okay, that there are more or less conscious efforts going on to keep African states poor. And this is sort of the general view of those born here or brought up here. Now, African students who, for instance, have just come here, who went to secondary school, for instance, in in, in Nigeria or in Kenya, and have just come here to study at university, have, of course, a very different view on that. So they would have been brought up there. They would have seen the kinds of things which their governments do on the ground, the corruption and all those negative negative things which we talk about all the time on the continent with regards to how power is exercised and how African governments behave on the ground. So they obviously hold will hold slightly different views or even quite strongly different views. However, this doesn't mean that they will express those views openly where their fellow white pairs in in the classroom, you see, because our problem really, and it stems, of course, from a certain reality, is that we generally have that feeling that, look, these white people, they look down on us. They generally speaking think they are better than us. They think they are more advanced than us, you know, more civilized than us, more developed than us and all that. And this is a feeling that is shared by black people, generally speaking, all across the world and across social strata. And so the idea is that, look, since we know that these people look down on us, then obviously when we speak to them or when we speak where they're within the room, we have to be careful what we say, not to further, not to perpetuate that situation of them looking down on us. So this means we should generally edit what we say. We should doctor it. So, okay, perhaps we should not speak that much about corruption that may be going on in African governments or about some of the other dysfunctional elements down the ground, you know, let's not say that because, you know, if we talk about that too much, you know, it's not going to help us. It's just going to make these people look down on us more 
So people will say, oh, you know, so we should try and speak maybe about some of the positive aspects. And there's, of course, a lot of logic to that. And, and I generally speaking, I, I agree with that. One of the worst effects of colonialism really is are those mental shackles that a lot of us are still under in, in the sense of, you know, that complex, that idea that, look, there are certain things we can't say because we know how these people look at us. And so let's not say this. We can say this when it's just us in the room. And so, you know, if it's just an African room, then people will say exactly what they think, you know. But once, once, once there's that white person in the room, they start doctoring it. And so I understand where this comes from psychologically. But of course, in the long run, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really solving any problems. So that, that's the distinction I would say. So the Western, the, the, the African who was brought up here in the West, will generally think along those Western lines, especially that kind of the more leftist, let's call it a man narrative, which you hear, you know, the Guardian, the BBC, etc. They will think along those lines. The Africans who grew up in an African country and came, they will think quite differently if you sit with them, if I sit with them, if you sit with them one on one. But if there's white people in the room, edit what they say also for those reasons, yeah. um, uh, which yeah. I gave you. And so, yeah, that's um, uh, that's how it looks pretty much. No, that's very interesting. And thanks for making that very clear distinction, because I definitely can relate to it and I do see it. And so and it's very funny because based on what you just explained, um, then you can understand why someone like me, I get to be very upsetting for a lot of people because the first bucket you talked about, they want to believe that there is this conscious effort of keeping us down when I think both you and I, you know, we know that the problem lies somewhere else, mm -hmm. but somehow they become so angry. And I want to talk to you about that because I basically sat down with uh, Jordan Peterson and we had this conversation and one of the clips that he took out, 10, 11 minute clip, and um, the title was Africa is not poor because of colonialism. I mean, Remy, you could not imagine. It seems like when you do that, you just hit a raw nerve, right? And I think some Africans are just ready and they're just so tired for this being our excuse for so long. And they're just like, finally, somebody say mm -hmm. this. But then you have so many of them who are so upset, insults up and down the street, you know? I mean, some people, it's almost like you just, you just assaulted their identity. And that made me really sad. But... For some of us, this is part of our identity to to be these oppressed people, um, to sit there and think that nothing will change until this other person, this other external factor that we have no control over until that changes. There's nothing we can do. And for some of them, they think that the way to change this external factor, but, you know, it's just to go for coups, go for violence, go for first we get the French out then we will be able to become prosperous. You can imagine again, like I said, um, me having such a big problem. I mean, people just being like, it's, it's just, I'm, it's quite polarizing, right? Those who are ready for another message are like, thank you, thank you. The other ones are like, you sell out. And then the second bucket you're talking about, oh, we got to be careful not to talk about our real problems because, you know, if we do, we're going to reinforce these stereotypes that they already have of us. And so you can imagine that there, on top of that, when you're speaking to someone, especially if it's a white person, and talking about the about issues... Of course, no, that, that's what would really annoy people because if you said that, if you said that in a Kenyan talk show, speaking to a Kenyan, or a Nigerian talk show speaking to a Nigerian, it would not elicit those kind of responses, those kind of furious responses, or what are you talking about, etc. The sin you committed was saying that to a white man a man like Jordan Peterson, who uh, generally, you know, people generally know his views and, you know, the kind of views he gives, you know, pro-capitalist, like you say, and also that, you know, some see him as, you know, some some kind of intellectual white supremacist, some kind of intellectual vision of a white supremacist, etc. Which is, by the way, something that I think is... In a way, some Africans, I find that, especially about Jordan Peterson, are really not, I'm not sure they're exercising their own, you know, independent and critical thinking. It's like the left told them, this is who Peterson is. And like you were saying, they haven't yeah. really bought those. So anyway, but go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, of course, no, ex exactly like you say. And, you know, it's, it's you, you know, you have to sit down and, and listen to him to, to pick out a, and make your own mind up on, 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 on what he is, etc. But, you know, a lot of people, like you say, you know, don't do that. They have this, there are these figures that exist out there, you know, these very well-known figures, and there are strong opinions about them. 
And, you know, somebody might read a sentence or two, which he says here and say, ah, OK, so he's one of those ones who say that, you know, we are worse, we're, we're not very civilized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he's an enemy, essentially. And this, this, this is an in-group mechanism. It's a psychological in-group mechanism that exists in all in-groups. And especially in groups that feel that they are positioned at the lower end of the social strata, at the lower end of, of, of the hierarchy system. They're especially sensitive to things like that. So uh, d- generally, within the in-group here, yes, we can say everything which we think, but the out-group members are divided into friends and enemies, into allies and enemies, so, okay, fine. If we categorize this one as an ally or as a friend, yes, we can be a bit more open. So essentially the white progressives, they would see as allies and friends. And um, the white people on the left, you know, in Guardians or the BBCs, etc. those ones, they would say, oh, yeah, th- these are, we, we can count on them as some kind of friends, you know. Um, but the Jordan Petersons, etc., who say that, you know, no, that left wing um, narrative um, is not um, the you know about that is is all about colonialism and etc. Those ones are our enemies, you know, and so you have that kind of response, uh, definitely. And for me, you know, I wish to see, I, I dream to see the day in which we simply because that's a kind of mental slavery, you know, because it's what what does this come down to? It's really it's the a fear of that white gaze. You know, yes. you've heard the term before, yes. you know, the white gaze. So it's really a fear of the white gaze that, you know, oh, we can't sort of, you know, that's as if that gaze sort of, if it's critical, we start feeling uncomfortable and awkward or, or react with aggression and things like that, you know. But we should be able to withstand that gaze, look anybody in the eye, including the, 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 the Jordan Peterson or any white man, and say, yeah, fine, we may be poorer today. When our countries may not be as economically developed as yours, et cetera, et cetera. So what? That, that doesn't make us worse human beings. You know, we have brains too. We know how to do things too. And one day we will get there, et cetera. You know, we, we don't have to be worried about what you think of us. You yes. My, my dream would be to see, you know, the day when actually as Africans, we, in a good way, I mean, it's in a good way, don't really care what others think about us. Because that, that's confidence. Confidence Thank is when you. you don't really care. And I don't mean it in a, in, a, in a negative way that you say, oh, you know, I don't care, etc. I'm not talking about that. But just that kind of positive, I don't really care what you think about me and what you people say about me. I'm doing my thing and that's it. When you get to that place, that's a place of confidence. That's a place in which, you know, you can face anybody. And freedom. That's freedom. That's the freedom because the white people, they don't care really what we think about them. In a lot of in a, in a lot of aspects, you know, there's of course those whole there's the, the, that old guilt discussion and all that. That's moral aspect. Morally, yes, but that's a different um, thing we can talk about. But when it comes to sort of you know what is written, you know, the average white Brit or the average white French person, they don't care what Kenyan media writes about them or what um, uh, what Zambian intellectuals are saying about them or what Nigerian intellectuals are saying about them. They don't care because they are confident in their achievements, you see. That's that's what it really comes down to. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, so well said, Remy. And um, for me, but when you're doing that, you're just telling me that um, basically right there, you're, you are reproducing, and you basically are telling me you accepted the hierarchy. Because how come then the other people don't care mm-hmm. about what you think, but you care about everything they think? And the other thing that drives me crazy is when you have these people like especially in the first group that you talked about, the people who, the Africans who wake up, who wake up in the morning thinking that there is a conscious effort to, to dump on them and go to bed thinking that there is a conscious effort to dump on them. They think basically, and this is what is so interesting to me, in their minds, the white people are always out there thinking about us. When I want to tell them, come to America, most Af- Americans have no idea, couldn't name you two yeah. African nations couldn't place yeah. most African nations on the map. The, do they think about you? No. Most of the time, they could care less. I don't care what you say. Sadly. Exactly. And so, But us to be like... So, Remy, I think my question to you... Oh, and by the way, on the care part, that's another thing I wanted to say because... um. Uh, when you say, because for me, that's really, that's true freedom. When you can just move along and, and uh, do what you need to do. I have a couple of questions, but the one, the next one I want to ask you is, Remy, can you walk us through why you think these two ways of thinking, where these two groups have landed, 
why is it, it's wrong and why it doesn't, why it stands in the way of progress for Africa. Why do you think the people, the group who have been brought here earlier um, at a young age, you know, saying, thinking that conscious efforts to keep Africans uh, down and poor, you know, that's, that's their thinking. And then the other group, the ones who came here at an adult age, um, basically saying, hey, we got to we got to censor ourselves. We, ha we have to edit ourselves because we don't want to speak the real problems in fear of um, stereotype reinforcement. Can you walk us through as to why you believe these are really, really detrimental, um, you know, ways of thinking and why this is not going to help us get where we need to get to? So definitely if you, you know, adopting that perspective that there are, you know, people out there who are consciously, waking up in the morning thinking, you know, um, how do I keep Africa down today? And how do I keep Africans down today? And uh, the problem with that is that, one, that can lead to a sense of hopelessness. It can rob people of their sense of agency, that they're able, you know, to, to, to change really anything. Because a lot of people do think that, oh, you know, as long as the IMF and the World Bank are there, you know, and people attribute incredible powers to these institutions, which, of course, are quite powerful, but are nowhere near as powerful as a lot of people actually seem to think they are. You know, it's, a lot of people seem to think that really, you know, the IMF sort of runs the global economy and decides, you know, who who, who is going to do well and who not. You know, th that's not the case. It's a powerful institution, but they, they don't run the global economy. But, you know, once people believe that, that there's higher forces out there, you know, it, it breeds a fatalistic worldview, just like, unfortunately, if you're talking about, um, uh, about home and African societies where people can attribute um, all negative things happening and anything happening to, to higher forces that, you know, oh, it's God, you know, that, that's God's decision, you know. If I'm poor, well, that's because God has decided it like that, you know. It brings that kind of fatalism that, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about that, really. And so in some African minds, it's because that's God, that's God's plan. And when God wants to help us, you know, he will help us and that's it. And in the other mindset, which is a very secularist mindset, of course, you know, instead of God, you have the IMF, the World Bank, and powerful forces out there, human human beings, powerful human beings, billionaires, and, you know, some other powerful white people out there who are, you know, coordinating things to make sure that, you know, it's the same kind of mindset that there's nothing really we can do about it. So it breeds fatalism. It breeds a sense of hopelessness. It creates resentment towards those people, you know. So that's definitely bad. Apart from that, it doesn't get at sort of the heart of the problem because any of us who have spent time living in, in African countries, we know that, yes, definitely these global structures, of course, they exist. And of course, as I write in my book, it's not about um, whiteness, it's about wealth. There are huge wealth disparities that yes. disadvantage us incredibly. And yes, some of them were established during the colonial period. There, there's no hiding that. There's no hiding the fact that Nigeria today is a country of over 200 million people and our national budget is equivalent to $30 billion. Whereas Britain, which is a country with three times fewer people, has a, a national budget of $1.2 trillion. So we're talking about a country of 200 plus million people has a budget of $30 billion. That's its national budget. And then you have a country like Britain that has a budget of $1.2 trillion for 68 million people. So those are different financial universes. So these are things that exist out there. So that's one. And, and so we should definitely know that. However, having taken that into um, consideration, we do know that the same Nigeria that I'm telling you about that has a budget of $30 billion, Okonjo Iweala, who's the head of the WTO now, uh, when she was finance minister of Nigeria, she, you know, the, did some investigations and they came up with a figure that anything from five to six hundred billion dollars has been stolen from Nigeria since independence. And that's assumed to be a conservative figure by Nigerian politicians there, you know. So there's that. And if that money hadn't been stolen and had been spent on Nigerian infrastructure, building schools, et cetera, et cetera, we would be in a very different place today. So there's those of us who have been in Kenya, we know that that is a huge problem. And, and corruption is even just one of the problems. The problem is, of course, generally speaking, even though it's, it, it's a cliche, I know, but it does boil down to that um, good governance, you know, generally speaking, effective governance. Those are the problems that our states are not run effectively. A state, of course, differs somewhat from a business. It's 
you're, you're dealing with you're dealing with a much more complex MMA mechanism, but it needs to run efficiently also. It needs to run effectively. You know, the reason why some countries are, are wealthy and other countries aren't, to a significant extent, there are, of course, various factors at play, but to a significant extent is because those countries that became wealthy are run much more effectively, much more efficiently. You go to a Japan, the way it's run, or a Singapore, the way it's run, or a Belgium, the way it's run, or a Britain, the way it's run, or a China, even the way it's run in its authoritarian fashion, etc. They are those the systems are run effectively. Things are coordinated. Everybody's moving in generally one kind of direction. It's not chaotic dysfunctionality, as often, unfortunately, is the case in some African countries. And we see the differences in the African countries that are run much more effectively, like a Rwanda, for instance. And we can have a lot of criticisms towards the way Kagame runs Rwanda, and there's, it's an authoritarian state. There's no, there's no dancing around that fact. And, and what happens to opposition members, etc. That's definitely a discussion that should be had. But in terms of how the state is run, it's run quite effectively. And that's why not just foreigners often have confidence in Rwanda and in the Rwandan state, not just foreign capital, but Rwandans themselves also. And various surveys conducted show Rwandans are among the most positive about their country's future. But there was one African youth survey, which was carried out, I think, in 2022, which spoke to Africans between the ages of 18 and 22. Uh, and they were asked, and, and people, 18 and 24, sorry, and people were simply asked, you know, how confident are you? Do you think your country is moving in the right direction? You know, and Rwanda, I think, was in the top one, two um, countries where the youths of that country feel that, yeah, our country is moving in the right direction, you know. So, so, so people know this and people can feel it, you know. And, and Rwanda is a country that doesn't have huge natural resources, a country that was in a genocide less than 30 years ago. It was on its knees. Yeah, it was on its really knees. Mm-hmm. Yes. And today, yes. its people have, you know, confidence in their future. So these are things which, you know, if they are put in place and, you know, the, the people there on the ground, they know about all this. They, all this is, you know, this, like I say, unfortunately, we are often disingenuous in the way we talk about these things. Once we know there's a foreign audience li- listening, especially if there's a white audience listening. Because when I observe Nigerian Twitter, And what people are talking about in Nigeria when there's an election happening in Nigeria, it revolves around these issues we're talking about, that we need good governance, we need strong institutions, and we need to be able to get... So it's not like people don't know these things and, you know, I'm saying something here that people don't know. You know, people know it. The problem is us being, you know, afraid of in that international forum saying these things openly, simply, you know, how it is. And that doesn't help anyone at the end of the day. No, that doesn't, that doesn't help anyone. And, um, you know, again, wasting our time caring about what other people care about. Um, if there is a problem, the best way to solve a problem is to talk about it and talk about it openly because, you know, so that way we can collaborate around, um, the issue and, um, we're not allowing ourselves that. And I find that what I find even worse is when we're among ourselves where we speak about these things very openly, we're not very productive. Because we're stuck in just complaining, you know, and the minute you try to bring up solutions, then um, it goes back to, oh, well, but that's not going to happen because, you know, like they're going to complain about our governance or our leaders. And then when we start to talk about, you know, so- solutions, even as to ha- what could be done, then right away, oh, well, that's never going to happen because, you know, the IMF, because, you know, um, France, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're going to, you know, any, any one of these people who tries to do something will be killed by those people because, you know, this huge conspiracy against us, right? So I have found that to be a problem, but I wanted to go back to the Rwanda situation because I think... Um, it's to me, it's interesting, right? When we do the survey and we find that Rwanda is one of the top two where the people, especially the young people, are the most um, optimistic about the future. And I'm seeing it. I mean, literally, uh, young Rwandans are going back home in droves, right? They're, they're, and it is true. I feel, the, I feel the excitement. I have been you know, dealing with Rwanda for a long, long time. Um, started going there maybe a, a decade ago or more and just have been watching all of this. Because when I see the youth, people who nobody forced Mm -hmm. when we did the surveys, unless you don't believe in surveys. But when a survey asks somebody and you find that the youth here is the most hopeful, 
you know, because the whole Rhonda thing is so muddy. And this is what I find so sad because there are such Rhonda is a great example when it comes to economics and how they really have their act together. You know, if you read the Rwanda vision 2035 and 2050, they are so clear as to how by 2035 they get to middle income nation and by 2050 they get to a prosperous nation, a rich nation. The only country in Africa, you know, outside of Mauritius maybe and um, the Seychelles, you know, who coming from where they came from, which is most of other African nations, frankly, saying, and the way we're going to get there, if you read their vision plan, it's black on white. What they're saying is the way we're going to get there is we're going to be the ones who offer the best business environment in the world. And this is something that they learned from Singapore. These are some of the things that I talk about all the time. When you talk about good governance, in a way, you include it more or less in there. But me, I'm almost like, I want us to be crystal clear on, you know, if we only can do one thing right now, which can push all the other dominoes, I am really like, guys, let's try to focus on this economic freedom part. And that's what I have seen Kagame really put his finger on. And so for me, I'm just like, what I'm seeing is so many of our fellow Africans, we're looking at the one one or two nations that are coming from very far away on the continent, yet moving ahead and their youth, you know, seems to be on board, seems very hopeful. So they're doing something right, but we don't allow ourselves to look at them as an example, because we bought into the, oh, the authoritarian. And I understand my Congolese friends are always on my back because they're like, my God, no, no, no. It's because they're stealing our resources. And the truth is, I can't judge any of what's going on over there. These type, these type of issues are kind of deep. And also Kagame, when he says, uh, you guys have no idea what's going on with the genocidaires, you know, they're still out there. It's like in some places in uh, Europe, you know, I'm 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 all for free speech, so that's just me. But I hear all the I hear all the allegations and all the accusations, and my point here is not to refute which is true, which is not true, because some of this stuff is very complicated. But um, I think we all of us Africans need to also there um, make up our own mind about Rwanda and um, not not necessarily, you know, take our cues from what the West might say. I think it's a very complicated place. It's interesting. It's important to go to Rwanda, spend time with the people on the ground and also underground, listen to what's going on because and, and be able to take the baby out of the bathwater and not throw everything out together. And I feel like too often we do that and then we miss we miss what Rwanda is doing right, regardless of everything else that you know people people bring up and um, some of these questions I'm not the most qualified to talk about it but do I know that a nation that focuses on having a better business environment will thrive I know that that is true and is he doing it yes he's doing it so would I even be um you know shocked that his country is moving in the right direction and his youth feeling it to the point that among the most hopeful youth in the world and moving back home yeah. So that part, I am very qualified to judge. And he's doing it when there is causality here. Definitely. For me, the absolute priority in every African nation is economic development, is wealth creation. That is an absolute, absolute, absolute priority. And so whatever political system is in place that is enabled to engender that, that is enabled to push that forward process and is acceptable to the citizens of those country, of that country, then that's, you know, that's that, you know, that's that. And as you, you mentioned, the, the, the case of Singapore, Singapore had its own pathway, its own leadership, definitely not what the West would describe as liberal, democratic, etc. Definitely. If you look at the Persian Gulf states, the you know, Kuwait, UAE, Oman, Qatar, all those other countries that are doing very well. Of course, they have a lot of oil. But apart from that, they have invested that money. Saudi Arabia, they've invested a lot of that money they're doing very well and they're creating incredible business environments there and capital wants to go there. And they're obviously not liberal democracies. So, of course, that's definitely that. And for me, the absolute priority is that economic development at the end of the day, wealth creation. Absolutely, wealth creation. And I think like what you said, if the people, if the people of the country see themselves in it, it seems to be working for them. 
to the point that they want to do with Kagame what the people of Singapore have done with Lee Kuan Wu, right? Lee Kuan Wu was there forever. But people were basically, no, you're, we don't want you to go anywhere. Please stay and continue doing what you're doing. So this is where I also would like to stay. I'm very upset with my fellow Africans. I'm very careful when I say this because I don't want it to come across the wrong way. But I think we really missed the boat. We missed the mark. But I'm not surprised because we look at the wrong stuff. And, and the West, it's, it's okay for them. There's a lot of things that the West has done right. And a lot of things that the West is, you know, it also works for them because of how it has worked for them. And what I mean by this has to do with this whole, this emphasis on, you know, democracy. It is, it's fine. I mean, don't take me wrong. I appreciate the fact that, you know, we have a more or less functioning democracy. But I think that um, the fact that they were exporting, making it almost sound as if democracy is the beginning and end of all, you know, for a nation to, to thrive. And when you look at all other type of nations around the world, they get to pick more or less where they kind of fit into that, um, you know, spectrum of going from the least you know, um, free to the most um, free, and in between you have variables, right? Us, I feel like one model has been sold to us when I see how much we go after each other's throat because somebody maybe wants to do one more term. It shouldn't be about that somebody want to do four terms, five terms or whatever, and, and then just base everything on that. So we, we causing ha havoc in our nations based on a, based on a metric that I'm not sure is the most right of all metrics if we talk about wealth creation. Democracy, in a way, um, it, has, it has all of its perks. And given a choice, I prefer that you know people are free and do their thing. Don't take me wrong. But I do think that um, when I see, for example, what's happening to Rwanda, for example, and that's a re really Rwanda is wh who I'm talking about, um, you know, he may or may not go for a fourth term. And all the stories that are being put into people's brains as to, you see, he's a bad guy because he's going to go for a fourth term. Are we doing that to Singapore per se? Because going back to what you said, as long as the people seem to be rallying behind him, who, who are we to say to them, um, well, you should not accept that? Who are we if, if the people are saying that? You know what I mean? So this is where I'm really mm -hmm. so upset because we believe, we almost have drunken this Kool-Aid that democracy will bring us everything that we need. Is democracy a nice thing to have? Absolutely. But is it really what um, is going to get us where we need to get to between democracy and economic freedom, for example? Which one is most important? I would like to argue that you put economic freedom in place first, then people become prosperous. And once they become prosperous, actually, then they can really go as a middle class being the strongest, the biggest class in a country, because now you're a rich nation, the middle class then can really be the one that decides what type of regime do we want? Do we want something that's more this, more that, less this, less that? They get to decide what they want. But peoples who are hungry, people who are hungry, as most of our people are right now, no one really cares, starting with our own leaders, as to what type of, um, you know, regime they really want. So I don't know, um, Remy, I feel like I'm being a little bit muddy, but does it make sense to you? Do you agree, not agree? Or can you help me here? Because maybe I'm not very clear. It does. But look, the simple response to, to what you just said is that we see right now a growing frustration with the democracy as practiced in many African states. Mm -hmm. As practiced. Yeah, as practice. We hear about coups, like you say. Um, uh, recently, Afrobarometer um, uh, conducted um, uh, surveys which shown that especially younger Africans are increasingly frustrated with the system, with the democratic, with the so-called often democratic systems in their countries, and are more open to other types of, of, of leadership now, more open to military dictatorships or to other kind of alternatives, simply out of frustration, not because they don't like the idea of democracy, because exactly. surveys show clearly across 34 African countries that Afrobarometer um, uh, usually surveys that anything from 68 to 70 percent on average believe democracy is the best system. That's what they would like to see. But there's a difference between the idea of democracy, the ideal of it and what it actually delivers, because at the end of the day, the democracy is a means to an end.
in most cases, especially in countries that are economically underdeveloped. What people want to see is the end. The end is an improvement in their living conditions, in their lives, them having enough money to take care of their children, educate their children, grow up in in decent environments and think about the future and be able to leave something for their children when they go. That's what most people are preoccupied with. That's the end they would like to reach. And yes. democracy has been chosen in many African countries as the means to get to that end. And there's all sorts of you know good reasons for that. But one of the problems is that those democratic systems are not delivering. And that comes out clearly in surveys that people say yes, but they're not delivering. And in fact, they are often, quote unquote, so-called democracies. Even in, in Nigeria, where I grew up, you know, elections are rigged. How can you talk about an, a democracy if your elections are rigged? What kind of election is that? Because the key idea of democracy is that the people get to choose who is in charge. They get to choose who is president, etc. So if it's not the people really getting to choose, but it's some elites there who do this, do that, rig here, rig there, bribe here, bribe there, and are put in place, that means... The person there is not the people's choice. So that immediately negates the idea of the democracy there. So obviously there's all that, um, uh, there's all that going on there. To reiterate, to sort of, um, uh, definitely to agree with you, it's really about creating those, that economic environment for wealth creation to be possible. Look, how do countries become wealthy? There's generally three or four pathways which you have. There's generally three or four pathways which you have. A, you have some incredible amount of natural resources, like, say, Saudi Arabia or a UAE or a Kuwait. So you have an incredible amount of natural resources, a relatively small population. And so the the revenue which you get is really so much that you don't really need to do much. You can, you know, make a few investments here. And as long as the money is not all stolen, you can generally provide for your people. And that's what the likes of the Qatar, Kuwait are able to do. Yeah, very small amount of people. They could have been in the same situation, but look look at what Gabon has done. Yes, but the money is being but the money is being frittered away, exactly. Yes. So Gabon could be like that. Equatorial Guinea could be like that. So that's one possibility. But for that, you need to A, have an incredible amount of the natural resources, a lot. So like for example, you know, Kuwait is I think three million people or something like that. Or and they export like three million barrels of crude oil a day. Nigeria is 200 plus million people and we export less than 2 million barrels a day. So that's a completely different, that 2 million barrels we export a day, that's nothing for a population of 200 plus million. So just to sort of break this down. So A, one option is you have lots of natural resources, relatively small population. There's only maybe two or three African countries that have that kind of even potential. That's Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, etc. Um, so that's one option. If you don't have that, so either you don't have huge natural resources, or you do, but the money is being frittered away, or you have natural resources, but a large population, and so it's not enough, really, to take care of things, then a second option you have is to be a trading country. So essentially, you establish your wealth through trade with others. Britain is a trading nation. Britain doesn't have huge natural resources. Of course, there's the whole you know, imperialism, etc. But essentially, it's a trading nation. Singapore, which you talked about, it's a trading nation. It don't, not huge natural resources there or anything like that. They made their money through, um, through trade. So your other option is to be a trading nation. Obviously, to be a trading nation, geography also matters. So to be a trading nation, it's much easier if you are a nation that has access to the sea and you are strategically placed, uh, positioned in such a way that trade can flow through your country and from your country. So that's a second option. Again, there'll be a few African countries that have that option, that have access to the sea that could be trading countries. Um, South Africa, of course, would be um, uh, would, would be one example, and it does do um, uh, quite a lot of trade. But most African countries are landlocked. Many most African countries are landlocked; they don't have access to the sea. Um, so that's 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 your second option. And then your third option is essentially okay. We don't have that much natural resources, or they're not enough for everybody to go around. Um, with trade, we are geographically not that strategically located then your only other option really is to create such a business environment that foreign capital will want to come because we don't have capital. That's another problem which we have. We don't have capital, so we have to get it from somewhere. We need somebody to come into our countries and invest in them. 
And that third option is essentially the pathway Rwanda has taken. Yeah. Because they know the potential for them being a trading nation is not that much, even geographically. They don't have huge natural resources. And so they've essentially focused on that third pathway, which is building a business environment and generally speaking, an environment that would attract investment, that people would want to come in and put their money in uh, to your country. And that third option really is the only option that is viable and that is possible and really the only pathway for virtually all African countries, for virtually all, all African countries, you know. And so, so we don't really have a choice here. And really, I wish we would, um, countries would see really that we don't have a choice, really. That is what needs to be done, you know. Uh, otherwise, nothing is really going to move forward. Nothing is going to move forward. If that business environment is in place, look at, for instance, countries, you know, why do, you know, why does Apple... Google or why do some of these um, why do they, why did they place you know their factories in in China or now they're even moving because China is becoming more expensive and there's of course geopolitical tensions. Some of the favorite destinations now of, of, of foreign capital to move factories is Bangladesh, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Vietnam. That's where they're going. Why are they going to Bangladesh, Vietnam? Because those countries have been able to put infrastructure, a business infrastructure in place and create an environment in place that is attractive to the Apples and Googles and foreign capital of the world. They've been able to put that in place. So they're going there. And the same way, if Kenya was able to put that kind of infrastructure in place, that kind of business infrastructure and business environment, if Nigeria was able to, if Zambia was able to, those places would be even more attractive for them because the labor there might be even cheaper. Other things there might be even cheaper. There's, of course, we yeah. have the power problem and all that. So there's all sorts of, all, all sorts of factors in it. But bottom line... <laughs> is that if, for instance, the Nigerian government or the Kenyan government or the Zambian government was doing as much to create a business-friendly environment as the Vietnamese government, the Bangladeshi government, and a couple of other upcoming Asian countries that are under the radar now that people don't talk about that much, but that are really making huge strides, if they were able to put the things those people have, those governments have put in place, capital would have a completely different attitude towards Africa today. It would have a completely different attitude. Capital needs to multiply. It needs to multiply. It doesn't just sit in one place and say, oh, yes, we are here now. And it needs to multiply. That's the whole logic of the system. So capital is always looking for places. Both talent and capital. Exactly. So it, it's looking for places to go to, you know. It's, it's looking for places to go to. It says, you know, show me on the map where I can go. And, you know, if, if you can guarantee me or, you know, to some extent that I will make a 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent return, I'll go there. You know, that's 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 how the whole system functions. You know, the big capitalist in U.S. or in Britain or in Japan, um, and this is contrary to what people think, they would love to see uh, African countries that are business friendly, where they think yes. they can make money. They don't have to love Africans to want that. They don't have to, and we don't need them to. We don't need them to love us. We don't need them to love Africans. But if they see that, look, I can go to Zambia and make a good profit. I can go to Rwanda and make a good profit. I can go to Nigeria and make a good profit. Then they will go there. And then it's now up to us in those countries to make sure that it's not only them that make the profit. If exactly. they come to our countries, that we also get something from that profit. That again is, is up to our governments. This is so much music to my ears because you know that place where we landed on the business environment is is everything. But you know, and then I would go back also to the to the ones you were bringing up about earlier when you said uh, the different scenarios in which a country can can make it to success. And I would want to say that even nations that are um, natural resource rich uh, with small population, they can only rely on it for so long. You see, the reason why Dubai ended up where Dubai ended up within the UAE is because eventually Dubai realized we're going to have to diversify. We really need to diversify. Mm -hmm. We can't put all of our eggs in one basket. You know what I mean? Because the natural resources is really not something that you can really rely on because what, a couple of things are going to happen to oil at some point. You know, the technology is going to keep on improving. At some point, you know, we're probably, I see, I, I definitely see a world in which, you know, we're not going to be pumping oil from the ground anymore, right? It's going to be replaced by other technologies. You know, you, 
you're seeing all of these science, um, scientific, you know, like uh, discoveries that are being made. It's just really rather amazing. So we're going to get to a place where at some point oil, you know, really, do we need it? But if you have based your whole economy on it, the day that starts to happen, what are you going to do? And so now is the time to start diversifying. And in order to diversify, you have to put in place a good business environment so all of that other type of economy start to happen. And that's what, in a way, uh, prompted Dubai, the rulers of Dubai, that's what prompted to do what they did. They said, we cannot be relying on this oil thing for us for, for very long. We really should be thinking and thinking ahead. And, the and tomorrow is prepared today. And that's how Dubai embarked on this journey. And when they did that, Dubai too was more or less inspired by what Singapore has done. And they too said, we're going to have to focus on the business environment. The Dubai International Financial Center is another great example model, great example of that. Um, so right now, Saudi Arabia still has huge reserves of oil, but Saudi Arabia better be smart and, um, you know, prepare their tomorrow. Well, but they are, they are definitely, they are investing in, in innovation. And there's, the, the, there's a whole city they want to build, a small city. I can't remember the name of it. There's King Abdullah City. Yeah, we visited uh, King, King Abdullah City and they're doing a few of them. So, but my point is, even them are starting to do that. And uh, the rest of the UAE, whoever whether it's Qatar or all of them are starting to really think about a post oil you know, world or at least di diversifying and doing it right now. So my point is even natural resource rich nations understand that you can't just be relying on the natural resources because that's not going to help you yeah, get ahead. Yeah. So even them are going back, are, are are paying attention to the business environment. And then for trading, when you talk about the trading countries, um, Trading is made easier when, you know, there is um, economic freedom as well, the freedom to move peoples and goods, services, ideas, all of that stuff. So I, my, the point I'm trying to make is we come back, we fall back to the MVP, which is um, the doing business environment has to be right. But the problem I have with that, um, Remy, our people never talk about it. They never talk about that. Instead of talking about... We want um, to have really amazing and thriving business environment. Show us that we are ranked among the best in the doing business index ranking or on all of those indexes that measure how hard or easy it is to start a business. Show us that we are making progress on those rankings because it is there is a direct correlation between how high you're up there and how wealthy your nation is. I never hear our people demand that. Instead, our youth is always there being like, democracy, democracy, democracy. You see why we're like crossing. Things are crossed over. And this is the big problem we have where I'm here to say, focus on, on a business environment that's the best in the world. Then we're going to get the prosperity. Once we get the prosperity, um, that's when also the middle class gets to go and fight for more democracy, more whatever that your society wants in terms of governance. That's when you get the type of governance you want. But right now, if we can only accomplish one thing, knowing it's going to be the one domino that's going to help us with everything else, can we push for the domino of having the best business environment in the world? Can we have a business environment that's as good, if not better, than Singapore or Denmark? If we start talking like that, I'm, I promise you, we will get places. But right now, our youth is all over the place. They ask for everything except for that. And they're not even putting the right pressure on our leaders. When for them, all the pressure is, ah, we need you just to be better leaders. I don't even know what better leaders means. I, we, don't, we should not rely on better leaders. We should rely on strong institutions that are so strong that it doesn't matter if a leader is good or bad, there's not much they can do anyway because the institutions are so strong and that's all we should rely on and not strong men. Remy, this is a fascinating conversation. I love how in alignment we are because it's so rare, making it so refreshing to be talking to someone like you, Remy. So I want to give you the honor of the last um, few minutes. Remy, what's your advice? How do we move forward, Remy? I mean, one just what you talked about definitely that business environment thing is absolutely key, 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 key. And um, when I talked about how uh, nations also get wealthier uh, by trading a lot, um, one of the positives that has emerged in recent in in recent years it just needs to be practicalized is the African Free Trade Zone, the AFCA, which which is there now. 
Europe, 68% of the trade which European countries do is with other European countries. 68% of the trade which European countries do is with other European countries. In Asia, the figure is also, I can't remember, it's either 50-something percent or, or low 60s percent. In Africa, the, the, the trade African countries do with other African countries amounts to just 17% of their trade. Because we can't move. We can't we- We can't even fly easily from one nation to another. Exactly, because for you to move a product from uh, Lagos to Nairobi, it might cost you more than to move that product from um, Lagos to um, a city in China. Yeah. And by the way, that is part of the business environment, Remy. Remy, I'm not cutting you, but by the way, that, those things are part of a business environment. That's part of the things that fall into the business environment, Mm -hmm. but go on. Of course, definitely, because, you know, what do you need to move that Um, product from from Lagos to Nairobi and then from Nairobi to Lusaka. Obviously, you need the infrastructure in place. So you must have some kind of road, some kind of rail network to physically move the goods. And then you need at the borders where you'll be crossing from Nigeria to the other countries and to get to Lusaka, you need to have first relatively low customs duties being taken on top of those products. Yeah, so it, it, the price is not rising drastically once it leaves Lagos, and then by the time it gets to Kenya, it's not even profitable anymore. So you have to have low, very low, as low as possible sort of custom rate in between there to there, and then of course you have to when we're talking about the institutions crack down on on customs officials that may want to demand bribes from somebody to be able to move that product because that just increases the price, etc. And this is, of course, all within that um, uh, business environment. So you have to have the physical infrastructure in place. You have to have the policies in place. So that's keeping those um, the, the customs duties and all that that people pay as low simply as possible. So that if it you know if, uh, if it's costing the equivalent of um, cost me the equivalent of two dollars to produce in Lagos, uh, it hasn't cost me five dollars by the time it gets to Nairobi, but it's cost me maybe two dollars fifty cents, and then maybe I can sell that for the equivalent of four dollars, and I'm still making my profit. Yeah. Yeah. So that needs to be in place. So this African future zone, that's one of the key things, really, which we need to work on. That if, if it can be practicalized, really, and, and trade can be boosted within the continent, there's a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of opportunities there. Because even though, obviously, we definitely we need huge amounts of capital, you know, there is some money in circulation within the continent there. And there's a diaspora that is often quite well off. There's an African diaspora that is often quite well off outside the continent that would be very happy to invest their money in some kind of business if they felt that, oh, wow, I can invest in a business in Nigeria that's going to be selling something in Nairobi or in Lusaka and is going to be making profits and I'll be able to make returns of that. There are lots of Africans who are quite well off in the US, in Canada, in Britain and in Western countries who would love to be able to invest actually there in Africa. The only reason they're not doing it is because they're worried about the risk factor and the business environment there, you know, and all these other problems we talk about. That's the only reason why they're not doing it. But if those things were put in place, there'd be billions available in accessible capital just from the African diaspora. And the Indians did that very well when they implemented their reforms from the late 90s onwards. The Indian diaspora was instrumental in capital flowing to India once they started their, their, their reforms. The same with the Chinese diaspora. The Chinese diaspora was instrumental in capital flowing to China when they started their, their reforms. So that, that's, a, that's a potential which we have, really, that is there. Yes, There's billions it. and billions of dollars, really, in unlocked capital within that African diaspora. No, so I want to say if, if these things are put in place, if this, this, this business environment you know, is put in place, and obviously there must be good, again, to go back to that, I'm a cliche term, but it, it boils down to that. There must be that you know, good governance in place. So there must be because you know, someone takes policy decisions on custom revenues and things like that. If that is there, there is some capital which we have, which we have to work with. And once things take off, you know, again, what does big capital do? They look at the places, you know, they have... You know, they, they have meetings and then, you know, people come and make pitches and, oh, you know, where should I invest my money? Yeah, the big billionaire, you know, he stands and then he has, you know, consultants and he asks them, you know, where should I invest my money? And those consultants will say, oh, look, Zambia has been growing at 7.5% um, uh, rate for the past five, six years. There's profits to be made there. So you should either get this Zambia, really? Oh, wow. Okay. Tell me more about that. You know, that's how it works. You know, so if 
we are able to unlock the potential of the African diaspora capital to come into the continent and get things going, then the other capital in the hands of you know white folk or, or Japanese folk or, or Arabs and all that will also look and say, look, it seems you know there's something going on there. You know, I know somebody who's just made a ten million dollar profit, you know, in, in Kenya or in Zambia. You know, maybe I'll put my money there too, you know. But the ball needs to get rolling. Yeah. Yeah. And and by the way, those are the type of uh, that's the type of capital you want. Because you see, all capital is looking for a healthy, good business environment, for sure. But um, there, is a, there is a type of capital, which is usually the type of capital you want, that will never show up because if there is no good business environment. What, because when you don't have a good business environment, the only type of capital that gets to survive for the most part is that the capital that comes from crony capitalism, the one that comes from crony business. Yes. And those businesses are usually not the nicest or the best. At all. Cronies are not nice. Cronies are not nice. And so when you make a business environment so rotten that um, a normal business, somebody who just shows up, doesn't need to know anybody in government, um, is not there to pull, pl- you know, to pull strings. They just have a great idea. They have their capital. They want to work. They want to work hard. They just want to do their thing and thrive and have their and hire employees, treat them right because if you don't treat them right, they leave. All of that stuff. That type of capital does not come when the business environment is not right. You know, they have other things to do and they're going to go to the places where things are easier. And so what you're left with in general in places that don't have a good business environment is as a lot of cronies and also a lot of multinationals. Um, not saying that multinationals are necessarily bad, but the problem is if all you're left with is multinas- if a few multinationals on one end and uh, cronies, it's really not a good recipe for um, success. And we're seeing it right now. So what you're saying is very true. If we have better business environment, the diaspora is no stupider than any other diaspora. The diaspora is just waiting for the signal. The diaspora is African diaspora. It's just waiting for the signal that it's okay to go and build back home. The diaspora in Rwanda got those signals. Why? Because Paul Kagame put in place the right business environment and talent and capital from the diaspora and everyone else is hearing that and they're responding. They're responding and they're voting with their feet. They're going back home. Remy, I am um, I am very, very excited for you being on this earth, <laughs> you championing the message that you champion. Your book was a book I was waiting for. You know, even before you, I knew you were writing it, even before it was out there, I've been following you for a while and uh, I just loved everything you put out there. I love your beautiful insight of uh, 90% of the representatives of a black race uh, lives in Africa. And, um, you know, for me, it was always intuitive that the fate of black, black status, blackness status is related to the state of Africa. If we become prosperous, I believe 80% of racism as we perceive it is going to go poof in the air. I really believe it. Of and course. Your book, your book is such such a testament to that. And um, I think I might be the person who is buying the most books because you need to tell me how to get, um, you know, like um, multiple copies because I'm just going to be giving them away like little you know, candies because this is so important. The minute our people make that switch in their head, I think it's going to be game over. Game over. Game over, Remy. So thank you so much for looking where you looked. And um, I don't know if you have any parting words for our, you know, people listening to you. Um, if somebody is saying, I want, I really want to um, find out more about Remy. So what's your parting advice? And also, how do we get in touch with you, Remy? Well, parting advice, you can um, uh, check me out on Twitter at Remy Adekoya. One, I think that's my, yeah, that's my Twitter handle at Remy Adekoya One. So you can always um, uh, follow me on Twitter. And there I usually update um, uh, whatever I'm doing and you can find out any um, uh, information about me and, uh, and, and we can engage. Got it. Got it. Very good. Well, Remy, thank you so much um, for being here. And like I said, c- keep up the wonderful work. Um, keep talking, keep researching, keep sharing. I, I, I think the time is right for this message. I think many people are tired of having heard the same thing for the past 60 plus years since we got our so-called independences. And I want to lean on the people who are ready for something different. And uh, it's important that um, our voices are out there so that they know that they're not alone in the way they're thinking. Because millions of people 
think the same way we do, but they have been completely washed over by what I call the prophets and entrepreneurs of hate, doom, and gloom. And those people have wasted our time for too long and we've left them the field. Now we have to come back and really, you know, um, put hope forward, but hope with a solid plan, because that's really what we have. There is a solid plan to prosperity and um, we have all the reasons in the world to be hopeful. 